Welcome to the Providence College Podcast. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you like what you hear, please review and share with others. Email podcast at providence.edu with questions or comments. Go Friars! Hello and welcome to the Providence College Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Chittam, and I'm joined as always by PC producer and videographer Chris Judge, class of 05. Here at the Providence College Podcast, it's our job to bring you interesting stories from inside the Friar family. And today we are joined by Dr. Sharon Murphy, professor of history here at Providence College. Dr. Murphy, Sharon, thank you for joining us. Uh, Quickly, I want to touch on some of the books that you've written and you're currently working on. Uh, investing in life, insurance, and the antebellum America, other people's money, how banking worked in the early American Republic, and right now you're working on In Search of the Common Good, Banks and the Panic of 1819, as well as Slavery and Finance in the antebellum American South. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Before we dive into all of that, before we actually start recording, you're telling a very interesting story. Chris? Our producer noticed the glasses up there <laughs> on the bookshelf, the old school, the old school Big East glasses. What's yes. the history behind those? Uh, my dad was a huge uh, Seton Hall fan, sorry, uh, back when uh, I was a kid. And so he uh, collected, he had season tickets to Seton Hall and collected the glasses and we got to go to all the games. And so it was a lot of, a lot of fun. So I'm a little old school Big East. I can tell. Yeah. So Chris noticed those immediately as, what, about 20 years old or so? Oh no, they're older than that. Oh, okay. They're 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 probably 30, 35 years old. These are 1980s era. See, that just feels 20 years. Yeah, and it feels like 20 me. years ago. I wish it were only 20. As years. someone who's born in 81, I would like to think that is only 20 years ago. Thanks for making me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you've 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 distanced yourself from Seton Hall. You're here at Providence College. That's right. Um so, first of all, thank you for being on the podcast. I'd love to get into this and you really have you know, a wealth of, of research and work that you've produced in this area, in this in this kind of area of expertise. And in fact, a lot of that you were probably doing this summer because you received a prestigious NEH grant uh, before the summer started, uh, a funding rate for these grants. They have this 8% and you were the only person, only person in Rhode Island That's to receive right. one. I think there was an year? institutional one as well, but the only individual. The only individual. So that, that must've been something else when you received that. So Given that yeah, 92- I did a happy dance. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> well, since 92% of people don't receive it, do you do you start to plan accordingly as if you may receive it, or how do you approach that process? Um, it's uh, I've actually this is the third time I applied for it, so there is an element of uh, if at first you don't succeed. Um, but no, I don't plan for it. Uh, you know, if I right now I'm actually applying for a number of fellowships uh, for next year. I have a sabbatical coming up. And uh, that's a, those are much bigger grants that if I'm going to take a full year, I'm going to need. So um, so I'm, I'm on pins and needles right now as I apply, not knowing what I may or may not get. So, And what were you working on this summer? So this summer I was working on um, one of my new projects, which is on uh, banking in uh, the South and specifically banks using slaves as loan collateral. And so I've been... Um, Looking around, and the the book I just just published on banking, uh, as I was writing that book, I realized uh, no one's really looked into the relationship between banks and slavery, and I was kind of surprised by that. Uh, slaves were the main form of wealth in the South, uh, so it was kind of surprising that they weren't involved with the banks in some way. So I started looking into it, and I've started finding a treasure trove of uh, of information. And so this summer. I did some archival research, traveling around the South, and uh, tra- looking for needles in a haystack. But I found quite a quite a few needles to work with. So, and when you're doing that sort of research, do you go in knowing exactly what you're looking for, or is it more of like you're an archaeologist and you're digging, and you know you don't know what you're quite, quite what you're going to find, but you know that there might be something in there. You know, it's uh, project to project is different. So my first project on life insurance. Um, it was more of a broad sweep. I was looking for anything on life insurance and then trying to figure out, well, l- let me tell a story from what I'm finding. This one, I kind of know what I'm looking for. Um, so I'm looking more specifically for um, these banks and the evidence of them uh, engaging in slavery, um, uh, 
uh, foreclosing on loans with slaves, selling the slaves, then uh, engaging with the slave trade, which is one of the uh, worst aspects of slavery. Um, and so uh, I have something much more specific I'm looking for, which is making it a, a, an a interesting project in that sense. But I'm still surprised by some of the things I've found. And so that um, that is exciting as well. And considering that, especially the era that you're working in with a lot of the research you've done, you must at this point be pretty well versed in how to look for certain things or where to look for certain things as opposed to, say, you know, 10 years ago when you're researching a similar era or maybe similar topics, but not maybe as well versed in some of the research methods or, you know, the, the locations. So, uh, yes and no. Um, this topic is a little different. So um, some of the things are uh, different types I'm dealing with. There's some sources I'm definitely dealing with that I've never dealt with before. Um, at the same time, there's a, the, the whole process has changed in the last 10 years. So um, my first project, I was sitting on a microfilm reader going through New York Times, whereas now it's fully digitized and I can keyword search it. Um, when, uh, when I did my first project, uh, we didn't allow, they didn't allow uh, uh, cameras, digital cameras in most archives. Now, most archives encourage you to use digital cameras. So, um, you know, that's, that's a change as well. And so it, it, it's definitely changed how you do research. And so now I have piles of photographs that I took while in the archives, whereas before I would have suitcases full of photocopies, very heavy paper that I had to lug around. So it must wish you must wish that you could do some of your old research now and you compare those two methods. It must be like, oh, my goodness, this was so much easier. Yeah, there was definitely there's definitely things that I wish I could have done on the first project that just wasn't feasible when I was working on it. But at the same time, there there's something about the old methods that are important, too, that um, you can't keyword search everything. And uh, some of the stuff I'm looking at now is still it's still microfilmed. It's never it's not going to be something that's digitized. And um, so I'm still going through old microfilm readers. And, um, you know, so there's still some of the old sources that, that still matter. And when you're doing that research, like you mentioned about you know people using slaves as collateral and everything involved in that, is it hard to kind of go through that work and as you're researching it to go through it kind of dispassionately and just kind of gather all the information so that you can then, you know, synthesize it later and then take a deep dive into it. Is it hard to not view these people uh, through your own moral personal lens as you're going through it? Yeah. It's, you know, I catch myself sometimes because um, I'll be going through looking for slaves and oftentimes when some of the things I'm looking at are um, records where they actually had to record a mortgage and they'll list off by name, by sex, uh, by um, age, the the different slaves. And they're often you can see them in family groups and all. And so I'll on the one hand, I'll do a happy dance that, oh, oh I found, you know, this is great. And then I'm reading through and I'm like, oh, these are real people, and especially when you see the, the, the children. And um, it, it can be really uh uh, really depressing going through and seeing all these people over and over again. And um, so there, there is that aspect as well. Right. Cause you're happy because you found what you're looking for from a research perspective. And right. Kind of the human element of it, you know, well, I would assume it would weigh on you a little bit. It does. Like, hey, this yeah. Is pretty, pretty nasty stuff. Yeah. That's for sure. And, and when you look back to your, your previous book, uh, other people's money, how banking worked in the early American Republic. That it sounds it's almost like fiction. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous in terms of some of what like what passed as money or collateral and things like that. If you just just a quick overview of you know what that was and how that existed, kind of pre regulation, pre federal government, kind of having a hand in systematizing some of that. Yeah, um, up until the the Civil War and and really the the Federal Reserve in uh, 1913, um, we didn't have the system that we have today. Um, so the system that existed. Um, prior to the Civil War would be completely foreign to to any American. Um, it was a state based system. Um, and even within the states, they uh, the states would charter these banks and each bank issued its own currency and each um, looked different from each other. And you had to redeem it at that bank. You couldn't just uh, you had to trust uh, that the bank still existed, that the bills weren't counterfeit, that um, the bank still had money in its vaults and would uh, would honor those those bills. So it was um, 
I have a, a friend who also does a lot of research on banknotes who called it a game of hot potato, um, where uh, you take a bill and then uh, if you're questionable about it, you pass it off on someone as quickly as you can. So. I can imagine. It must not have, um, I guess if you lived in that era, what was the level of confidence in banks, I guess, in relation to today? You know, it, it varied widely where you lived and what time period you lived in. So um, there's certain moments of panic um, uh, where you had bank runs and a widespread f- failure of banks, um, 1819, 1837. Um, those would be time periods where people had very low confidence. Um, certain parts of the country, the South in particular, um, especially places like Alabama, uh, Mississippi, had no confidence in banks. And actually some of them had um, constitutional provisions in their state constitutions banning banks. Um, but other places had very vibrant banking systems, um, very successful banking systems. So uh, it really depended on where you lived. Uh, the New England had one of the most stable banking systems in the in the nation. So living up in uh, Massachusetts or Rhode Island, uh, you probably had pretty high confidence, even though Rhode Island also had one of the biggest banking scandals of <laughs> the the early republic. So uh, it, it, it was always kind of a... Um, a chance you were you were taking but people knew that it wasn't uh, it it wasn't like people were being duped they 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 understood the system more than we give them credit for understanding it and so they they functioned within it it was it was what they knew is what they had to deal with they didn't have um uh, uh the the monetary system was based on gold and silver but we had virtually no gold and silver in the country so we had to um the silver we had was uh mostly coins from foreign coins from mexico or uh uh, the Spanish colonies, um, we didn't have a whole lot of our own. So we had to, if you, if you had to buy and sell things, you had to deal with this dubious uh, paper money. So why would a state ban banks? What would be the, the reason for that versus if they, you know, they see other states flourishing fairly well with that system? Uh, they ban banks. Uh, usually this happened after um, something like the Panic of 1837, where uh, you have most of the panics began with a very speculative period where you have um, a lot of people uh, driving up prices on land, on slaves, um, and on cotton. And uh, and then the whole system collapses and prices collapse. And uh, a lot of people blamed banks for allowing that kind of speculation to occur. Um, so they would say, and Andrew Jackson was a proponent of this, the president, um, that we need to we need to rely on specie on on gold and silver. We shouldn't have these bank notes. That this is what's allowing this. If we just uh, uh, stuck to gold and silver, hard money as they called it, uh, we would be better off. Um, but as I said, the problem is we didn't have hard money to to deal with. So uh, the states that banned banks did not do well as a result. Either um, it stagnated their economy. Uh, banks from other states uh, operated inside their state, money circulated from other states, and then there's even less regulation of it. So uh, it tended to be a pretty poor system, but a lot of states uh, went that way. So when they centralized, it must have been a boon to those states that didn't really have a flourishing banking industry, or was it the opposite? I I, I mean, it's a little complicated because the... um, Initial system, the initial plan was to get rid of all those state banks and make a national banking system. Um, and that didn't actually happen. Uh, a lot of the state banks found a way to continue to function. Uh, the, uh, the federal government taxed banknotes out of existence, so banknotes disappeared, uh, at least in that form, and you had federal banknotes. But the uh, state banks uh, continued to function on deposits. And so we, we still today are left with this weird system where we have um, both national banks and state chartered banks. Uh, the Federal Reserve really is what uh, rationalized it all. Um, so it took a while from, the, from 1863, 64, when this first started changing, to 1913 when you get the Federal Reserve. It's a pretty long period of time to be trying to, to rationalize this whole system. And they have that kind of odd symbiosis a little bit between the private banking system and then you know the public banking system and then you also have just the government itself because they're so interreliant or that's probably not even a word it's very reliant on each other <laughs> this is the difference between the host and the expert so yeah. they're reliant on each other um and just what the role should the government have in banking 
And does that change during certain periods or during, during different fluctuations and all that sort of thing? Yeah, there's definitely a question of how much um, the the government should be involved, especially the federal government. So you have the federal government chartering the first and second banks of the U.S. Um, that uh, end up both not being rechartered. Um, and so you have the states really dominating in this. And then you also have uh, private banks that are banks that don't have any charter at all. Um, some of the states have... Uh, banks that are actually owned by the state. Um, those are public banks. Um, and so there's a whole mix of different types of, of banking systems. Um, some states uh, eventually have general incorporation laws, free banking laws, which um, are not as uh, free as they sound, but um, just uh, allowed anyone who met certain requirements to establish a, a bank under certain regulations. So it really was a... Um, a system where you have a, a lot going on and again it depended on where you lived what kind of system you were you were working with and it could be very confusing and um some of the systems worked better under pressure than others right and then just from the confusing aspect or the complexity of certain banking systems is that related to fraud or counterfeit in certain ways <laughs> well uh counterfeiting actually um kind of is overarching all of the system uh, when you have uh, all these different types of banknotes, I mean, at the at the height, you probably had nine thousand different types of banknotes uh, from different types of banks, different denominations. We're we're kind of used to the standard. We have a one dollar, five dollar, ten dollar. Um, you could have denominations, any type of denomination. Um, counterfeits could be anything from a made up bill and you had um, professional engravers that all they did was counterfeit bills. And sometimes they were um, more realistic than some of the bank bills. Um, you had people who would um, chemically alter a bill and turn a $5 bill into a $15 bill and uh, try and, and, you know, pass it off as a higher denomination. Um, people passing off bills on banks that had failed as if they were still a real bank. So the, the, the counterfeiting and fraud um, were across the board. And it was really hard to um, really hard to counter that. Uh, and there was there was all sorts of efforts to try to uh, keep that in check. But it was it was a huge problem overall. And it continued to be a problem even under the uh, the system uh, once the federal government took over. But it was easier when you had fewer bills. So do you see any parallels in that era with what you see now with cryptocurrencies and how that is kind of evolving? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a little, you mean like Bitcoin and yeah, stuff like exactly. that? Uh, you know, Bitcoin is kind of its own thing. I never thought about Bitcoin being similar to uh, a banknote system. It is kind of a shadowy uh, uh, kind of realm, even though in theory, Bitcoin is real, whereas counterfeit money is not. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how much I see the, the parallel there. I'd have to think about it more. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. So... You know, Got you, me a gotcha question. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, I don't have many of them. That's for sure. Um, so you know, you went to undergrad, got your master's, and your PhD, all at UVA. Yes. When you were going through all that, through through that process, what made you want to specialize in this area? So it was interesting. Um, I, I I say I was born a historian. Uh, I always was interested in history, and uh, I was constantly asking my grandmother to talk about her family and stuff like that. Um, but when I got to college, I, I took an economics class. I was like, oh, this is actually really cool. Um, and so I started thinking, we, we actually had uh, a, a pretty vibrant um, economic history, uh, a couple professors who taught economic history. And, and so I'm like, oh, that's a great way to bring both sides of this together. And um, so that's where I, it was. It was a way to bring two things that I was really, really found enjoyable um, together. And then uh, initially, my my first project was supposed to be on banks. That was what it was going to do. Um, and uh, the running joke is that uh, your first major project is always about your father um, or about your parents. Um, and my father actually did work for a bank most of his life. <laughs> and so um, and then I, I, I ended up doing life insurance instead. But now I'm, I'm I'm back in in banking. So now, was there ever any interest on your side to potentially enter the private sector in one of those areas? You know, I, I when I, growing up, I went through all the different potential. I was going to be an archaeologist. I was going to be a lawyer. Um when I was about a junior in, in high school, I, I was like, oh, you know what? I, I really want to teach. 
Um, and uh, I had some amazing high school teachers. And um, and so I, I started really thinking that that was the way I was going to go. And it wasn't until when I was an undergrad um, that I realized how much I loved research and writing and uh, that to do that, I would need to to go to the the university level to do that. So um so I was never really thinking much about maybe 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 it was on the mar- when I was on the job market I was thinking oh god you know if I don't get a job I may have to go private sector but <laughs> um I was always thinking teaching it was just a matter of what level I was going to end up at and I'm not a morning person so a high school teacher just wouldn't have cut it for me <laughs> in your current role how much do you put towards teaching versus your own research projects um you know it it depends on the time of year uh, so, you know, when we're in semester, um, there's really minimal that I get done as far as, um, my own research. I try, you know, September, I usually can get more done October, a little less, uh, November, December, I'm pretty much inundated with papers. Um, so it ends up being a lot on the breaks that I do it. And like I said, I have a sabbatical coming up, so I'm really looking forward to that because I'm, I'm hoping to get a, a, a lot done. Um, but at the same time, I, you know, try to bring my research into my classroom. I talk about it with my students. They usually know what I'm working on and, um, you know, have a, as the history majors tend to have an interest in what I'm, I'm working on. And so I try to make it part of the class as well. So what is enjoyable? Because I hear all the time about how difficult and painstaking writing a book is. Anyone who's <laughs> written one will talk about it in, in those terms. However, you've written several. You're working on two right now. So what's enjoyable about writing a book? Yeah, I, I actually, I, I think the most uh, painful part is the editing, um, which is probably the most important part. Um, I actually love sitting down and just, you know, getting my ideas out there and um, uh, trying to tell stories. I mean, at, at heart, historians are storytellers um, and getting some of those stories out there and uh, the experiences that people had and um helping people connect with those. So I actually, I actually love that part of the process. Um, when you, when you actually get to the point of needing to publish it and the finalizing the project, that's what, that's what I find painful. Uh, but the writing part itself, I, I find, uh, extremely enjoyable. Well, that's good. Cause it's obviously <laughs> a pretty big part of the job. Um, so when you're talking to, you know, current students or students who've gone through PC and they're looking at their own prospects of, Hey, they either want to be, you know, kind of following your footsteps, you know, whether it's a professor here or somewhere else or whatever their um, their aspirations are. What are some of the some of the advice that you give to them? Because it seems like you were able to successfully marry your passion with your profession. And I think for a lot of people that can be a struggle. Yeah, it's uh, I mean, I feel very blessed to to have the, the job I do. It really is. I do have a, a good life. I mean, I, I do do a lot of work at midnight. Um, so in that sense, you, 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 I never leave my job behind. Um, but at the same time, I do love what I do. Uh, but it's a difficult, uh, difficult to get a job. Um, and, you know, when I talk to students who come in and say they're thinking about doing a, a PhD, um, I really want them to understand um, how difficult it is. And a lot of it has nothing to do with you. Um, you could be the best person in your field and there happens to be no job off- openings in that field that year. Um, and there's nothing you can do about that. So I tell students that um, if you really want to do a PhD in history, you do it because you can't imagine not having a PhD in history. Um, a lot of them do it because, oh, you, you, it looks like you have a good life. And, and I do. Uh, but I tell them if you're doing it for the job, the job might not be there. Um, so you have to do it because you you just can't imagine not not doing it, not doing that dissertation. And um, if you're passionate about it, hopefully it works for you. I, I know a lot of fabulous scholars who don't have jobs. Um, and so it's it's really a, a, a cruel field to, to be in in that sense. So um, I try to make it clear to students that they don't do it for the job. They do it for the for the passion. So then what differentiates between the scholars who do end up landing, you know, really good jobs. And those who, like you mentioned, are kind of still in the process or hoping that it works out. Uh, I mean, you do have to do good work. I'll, I'll, I'll say that, but there's lots of people who do really good work. Um, after that it's, it's luck. I I hate to say it. I mean, uh, you know, I, I know when you interviewed Ted Andrews, he talked about the number of jobs he, he applied for. Um, oh, I had, I had, you know, literally, um, 
I, I was on the job market two years, and um, each year I probably had 75 to 100 jobs that I was applying for. Um, there were jobs, uh, I think the, the job that, the position I got here at PC, um, there was probably two or 300 applicants for that job. Um, so it, it, was it that I was that good and that much better than everybody else? No. <laughs> There's um, a lot of it is, you know, what they're looking for. Um, schools or lo- departments are always looking for something really specific that you, that doesn't appear in the job ad. And it's just a matter of, do you, do you end up fitting that? So you do have to do good work. But after that, you know, you're still competing with a lot of people who do good work. And it's, you know, are you the person they magically pluck from the pile <laughs> to get the interview and uh, and get the job? Right. And then it's also the the aspect of that selection from on your part, whether you're going to accept a job offer or not, where a lot of professors, they, their idea, it seems like their ideal is to get to a place and then really make their mark there. And hopefully they get to stay there for a very long time. So it kind of presents a problem, I would assume, where you don't know if you're going to even receive a job offer from anywhere. Right. So, all right. So all of a sudden there's this scarce job market. And then are you going to say, hey, not only am I willing to accept this job offer for next year, but this could be a lifetime decision right. on my part. That must weigh heavily on you during that process. It does. Um, I actually, the, the year I got the offer here, I had another job offer. Um, and, uh, we're deciding between the two job offers and, uh, we knew the, the other job offer was a school in Corpus Christi, Texas, um, and which I didn't think was the most desirable place, but my husband for some reason did. And, um, you know, but in our minds it was, well, if we go here, it would only be for a couple of years, but then you're gambling again, that you could go back on the job market and find another position. And, um, and that can be really, a, a really tough thing. And, um, you know, he's, he's not a big fan of winter. Um, but whenever, uh, whenever he complains about Rhode Island and in general, he's happy with Rhode Island, but whenever he complains about Rhode Island, um, I used to tease him that I'd take out the list and the list was all the other places that had job openings in my field that year. Um, and, and compare that to, I mean, Rhode Island was really a, a great location for us to, to end up. Um, there were schools in, the, especially my husband's a sailor. So there were schools in Nebraska and Iowa and, you know, all sorts of, I had two on-campus job interviews at different schools in Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> I felt, I felt like I was destined to end up there. And, um, you know, so it, it really, we feel quite lucky that we ended up here, but it really is a decision, you know, do you gamble go someplace that maybe you don't want to be forever and hope that you can get a better job somewhere else or, um, you know, hope you get the job at a, at a place where you actually actually like and can make a career out of. And you bring up a good point where you just mentioned that you had two job interviews, in-person job interviews in Alabama, in Birmingham, yeah. <laughs> which obviously was, you know, the, the, the central location for the civil rights movement. Right. And then but even these topics, I mean, that's, you know, that's really ground zero for a lot of what we've talked about in some of your work. So you're you know, being based out of Providence, Rhode Island. How for you introducing some of these topics to your students, if you can incorporate your research into what you're doing in the classroom, how much of that is giving them a framework of what it was like in the South? you know, just as a foundational element before you really dive into some of these topics. Yeah, no, I mean, it definitely, wherever you teach, uh, you're teaching different types of students. Um, and so it has a different basis. I remember um, when I was in graduate school and teaching students in Virginia, um, they had a very different knowledge of the background of the civil rights movement. Um, and so uh, many of them, um, had uh, family members who had perf- personally experienced the civil rights movement, for example, um, in in some way, either as a white supremacist or as a black who was um, oppressed by it. Um, and so it was much you know, closer to them. Um, up here, we have the northern, oh, that wasn't our problem thing. So I, I actually like to make students feel uncomfortable. Um, and so when I do the civil rights movement in, in the north, for example, I... Uh, I talk a lot about problems that happen with busing in Boston. And suddenly I'll have, you know, half the students say, oh, my uncle was at the high school at that time. Or, you know, and so they, you know, getting them to, to realize that, that, you know, these kinds of issues matter to them. And it, you don't have to be from Alabama to have um, experienced these types of racial issues or to be involved, uh, 
you know, when I talk about slavery, you know, the involvement of Northerners in slavery and how how um, important it was for Northern merchants. Um, Newport merchants depended on slavery and were heavily involved in the slave trade. So, you know, making those connections for for the students to see that. That's a great point. And then, so, you know, the, the book you're currently working on, you're spending a lot of your time on slavery and finance and the antebellum American South. How do you choose what you're going to research and put that much time into? It, it, coming up with a topic can be one of the hardest things. And uh, the, the reason I ended up with two topics is I, I actually got involved in one topic and then decided I liked one better now. <laughs> but um it's a it's a partly finding something that you're passionate about, finding something that no one else has done, which can be extremely difficult. Um, finding those gaps in the scholarship, uh, it's uh, it's difficult. Sometimes it's something that someone says in a book that strikes you as odd or wrong or needs more research or uh, a colleague says something to you. You never know what's going to set off a, a new project. But, um, yeah, it, it took me a while to come to this this current project, so it was uh, uh, a difficult process. And when you finished some of your previous books, did you have internal and external goals for what you hoped that book would accomplish? I, yeah, I mean, uh, certainly I wanted, you know, the first thing you think about are book reviews. <laughs> you know, how well is it going to be received? Um, my first book won... Uh, a prestigious award, which was the shock of my life. It was, uh, I, I'd say, it was the highlight of my academic career. Um, and uh, I had actually just given birth to my son. And so uh, I had only been out of the hospital a week or two when they called to tell me I'd won this award. And, and I, I really thought I was just, you know, in postpartum fog and wasn't actually hearing them. So um, so best best week of your life. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I'm like, this is a life's pretty good right now. You know, I may not get much sleep, but it's pretty good. Um, yeah. So you have hopes. I mean, this this new book um, uh, that, that just came out, I say, I, I hope is useful. It was meant to be a useful book to help people understand how money and banking worked in this period. So uh, I'm hoping that both uh, my my colleagues in the historical profession, but also students, uh, hopefully they'll assign it in classrooms and um, I a, a lot of it I assigned in my classrooms. I had my students actually pick through it and tell me um, what they like, what they didn't like, what they thought was boring, what they wanted me to explain better. And so so a lot of it comes out of my that book comes out of my teaching directly. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of this. We really appreciate it. Before we get going, I got one more question to ask you. We just started the semester. Obviously, you're you know really into your class work right now. When you look at the students you've had or the students you have that you would say are the best students that you've had mm -hmm. in the classroom. What are some of the key characteristics that they have that you wish say every student brought to the table that are things that are within their control? Curiosity. The best students are curious They're They challenge me. Um, my best classes, uh, I'll be, you know, lecturing and, and they'll be, pushing me for more information or questioning whether that's really the answer or, or pushing. So the, the students, and it's not necessarily the, the A student who is uh, the best at that. Um, there's some really, really good A students that are not my favorite students. <laughs> um, but the, the curious student who really wants to understand, wants to know, that, that's my, my uh, favorite trait in any student I have. So do you go out of your way to try to cultivate that if you see that start to germinate early in the semester? I do. I do. Uh, uh, you know, and uh, the my, I have to say, history department has fabulous students. Um, and so oftentimes a, a class, if you have enough of those students, it will influence the rest of them. Um, and so it tends to be that my, uh, my history classes in particular uh, – you know, students right from the get go, I, I encourage them to talk. I ask questions constantly. I encourage them to to get involved. And then it kind of takes on a life of its own. And even we're three classes in and I'd say uh, I already have students who are, are questioning me, stopping me in the middle of lecture. Can you explain this more? Why was this? And and that's what I love. And um, that that's uh, that's something that uh, the history department, I think it goes from class to class as well. So. Well, that's some very valuable insight. Thank you so much, Dr. Murphy. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.